Here's the man who didn't know he had a team, didn't know he had a drive, who's now going to take victory in Melbourne. Jensen Button crosses the line, takes the chequered flag. Jensen Button's a winner again. Braun GP are winners on their first race appearance. And not only that, it's a one-two finish. Button from Barrichello. The smiles are on Ross Braun and Sir Richard Branson. What a result, and history too. Fangio did it with Mercedes in 1954. Jensen Button has done it with Braun GP in 2009. From pole to victory on his debut for a new team. Absolutely remarkable. Honda's pulling out of Formula One and plans to sell its team. Unless a buy is found before the end of the month, they'll have to withdraw from the 2009 competition, ending the Japanese car giant's nine-year involvement in the sport. Braun GP is one of motorsport's greatest fairy tales. But to tell it in full, we need to take a step back to the previous season of 2008. And to help me do so, I managed to recruit the help of a few crucial personnel from Braun GP. My name's um, Nick Fryer. My name is Nicola Armstrong. My name is Jensen Button. And I was the CEO of Braun GP. In 2009, I was working as a press officer. And uh, I was one of the two drivers for, for Braun GP. Nicola, Jensen and Nick were crucial parts of that 2009 season in their own independent ways. On top of that, however, they had also all been around at the end of 2008, when things hadn't been anywhere near as good. For Jensen, the 2008 season saw him finish 18th in the championship, and for Nick, Nicola and the team as a whole, it was a lowly 9th in the constructors. It was far from impressive and left Honda with some thinking to do, and ultimately, it wasn't good news. We were taken into a conference room where the great and the good of Honda sat around the table with uh, people from Honda UK and people from Japan and uh, a whole bunch of people who amazingly just said, please go back to uh, Brackley, get everyone together and tell them we're closing down. Another victim of the economic meltdown. This time it's dealt a major blow to the richest of sports. Honda's pulling out of Formula One and plans to so sell I went away team. doing my training and as I flew back, I landed at Gatwick waiting for my bags. I got a call from the team saying that uh, Honda are pulling out of the sport. The team no longer exists, basically, and we won't be going racing in 2009, um, which, which hurt for many reasons. One, because I, wasn't, you know, I didn't think I'd be racing in Formula One. I'd won one Grand Prix in my whole career at that point, which which wasn't what I set out to do. Still, pretty pretty cool achievement, but you know the, the World Championship, or at least fighting for the World Championship, was always my aim. And also, I know I knew how good the car was going to be for the next year. You know, two thousand eight was a tough year, and one of the reasons was because we didn't develop it. We spent the whole season developing the next season's car, which turned into the Braun. So uh, it was a pretty tough moment. So I had a lady who was my boss, who was our PR manager called Tracy Novak. And I distinctly remember Tracy taking me out for lunch. I think it was, my mind tells me it was on a Wednesday, um, on the Wednesday, and, and then breaking the news to me over, over lunch in quite a crowded cafe, which she later said was probably a bad idea <laughs> because obviously I was very upset. She became very upset um, and it was quite difficult to have a conversation in that environment. So um, I, I, rem I distinctly remember sort of us struggling through the lunch and then going and sitting in her car for a while afterwards and sort of chatting through all the details. So I obviously knew probably two days, I think, ahead of all the, the employees. Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty devastating, I think. Um, the news to the team was broken by Ross and Nick on... Thursday um, in our race space and I have to say they did an absolutely brilliant job of handling a very difficult situation um, they're both very good people managers I remember Nick taking very clearly the sort of business line stating out the facts being brutally honest about what the situation was um, and then Ross came in afterwards to do the sort of more emotional side sort of giving everybody the hope that there would there was a future out there for us um, and it was very emotional um, but I, I kind of remember Ross saying, we're not going to let this beat us. Um, are you all with me? And there was sort of a, a big cheer from everybody in the factory. Um, and I think we went out of that obviously feeling quite concerned, but also with a degree of optimism that we had two very heavy hitters who were fighting as hard as they could to keep our jobs. We went back to uh, the factory and got everyone together and said, look, uh, we're going to fix it. We're going to go out looking for buyers. And uh, of course, you're going to worry. But uh, 
we, we, we think we can find a solution to this. Spent a lot of time on the phone with my manager working through ideas. You know, first of all, it was, is there another seat available? And there was one at Torre Rosso, but not a seat that was going to sort of further my career. So we're like, okay, well, let's push and see if we can get someone to buy the team. So look for new buyers they did, a process that proved to be much easier said than done, especially in the depths of one of the worst economic landscapes the world has ever seen. Ultimately, however, there was a decision that had to be made. Quite quickly, we had probably more than 20 prospective buyers and myself and the finance director and the legal director set our aim on talking to some of these candidates who turned out in many cases to be not the most straightforward people, let's say. So we had a, a period of several weeks talking to um let's say, people you wouldn't normally get to know in normal circumstances, because uh, in the depths of the financial crisis, there weren't too many credible buyers who wanted a not very successful, very expensive Formula One team that was probably going to eat a couple of hundred million in the following year. And the people who did show interest were those that possibly, with, with a couple of exceptions, you know, were opportunists, let's say. Honda came to the you know, same conclusion that Ross and I had come to, that this wasn't the greatest idea. So by the time we got to Christmas, we really had got nowhere in terms of, I mean, I've been meeting people every day, but there was no one Honda hand on heart would be able to say, you know, we've, we've, we've sold or given the team to these people and they're good future owners. So uh, we came to the conclusion that possibly we weren't going to find anyone suitable. So maybe we had to think about... Um, doing a uh, so-called management buyout. And then suddenly it went a bit quiet. I was like, okay, this is strange. And then they called us back and said, actually, they're going to they're gonna take control of the team for a, for a dollar. So um, yeah, at least we were going racing. We were just a little bit worried whether we'd have the funding to actually, if, even if we started with a good car, to, to, to finish this season out. Um, so I think everyone in the team was very excited that the team was racing against. A lot of people were still getting laid off. Um, which obviously hurt. You know, we're going to the first race. We think the car's going to be good, but there's also hundreds of people back at Brackley that are getting laid off because they can't afford to pay them. Um, so mixed emotions once again. Uh, and then obviously we got to the first race. The car was competitive, um, but there were many areas still that we were we were lacking. One was pit stops. We hadn't done any pit stop practice. So, um, you know, we were so slow at pit stops, um, but still, even with the issues that we had, um, the car ran reliably and we finished with a... Whoa, hold on there, Jensen. No spoilers. First things first, we need to have a chat about what happened when the newly branded Braun GP car rocked up at pre-season testing. We went to the last test of the year because obviously we didn't have a car that was uh, ready to go. So the other teams had been testing for several weeks and we hadn't done any testing at all. We went along to the last test and put the car on the track and wow, caramba, this thing was unbelievable. I came in the pits and I, my engineer walked up to me. It was Andrew Shovelin, who's now the chief engineer at Mercedes. Uh, he'd looked at me and said, so how was it? And uh, I said, well, it feels okay. I mean, the, the balance isn't quite there. It's a bit too much understeer here. We've got a bit rear locking there. I said, how's it? I look on the timing screen. He said, you're quickest by six tenths. So I, I said, hang on, I don't believe you. So I got out of the car. Um, you know, we were ready to go for our second run, but I got out, took my helmet off, walked over to the timing screens and, uh, and uh, just to have a look where we stood. And I was like, okay, that's pretty good. So then we um, got back in the car, put new tires and went out. And I think we were a second quicker than everyone else, if not a bit more. And, uh, and then it, was, it came back in. I was like, yeah, it feels a bit better. There's still room for improvement. And the, and the team just said, JB, we're going to have to put fuel in it. We're going to have to put fuel in the car. We're going to have to make it heavy so we don't look so quick. People are going to think we're running underweight and testing to try and find sponsors because the car was completely blank. We had Braun GP written on it and that was it. So we put the fuel in and we were still quick still the quickest even with fuel on board so uh, a great first test and i think you know there were moments during the day where all the mechanics would disappear at the garage um putting putting bets on for the season um you know because the odds were so good of a startup team winning a world championship i think they were getting 250 to one or 500 to one but so, uh, it was it was massive so after a really tough winter the team pulled through they had done it and they had a really good car to come along with them 
By this point, Honda was but a memory in the rearview mirror and the future was white, fluorescent yellow and sponsorless. But nevertheless, Braun GP were going racing. It's race day here in Melbourne as we continue with what could shape up to be one of the best Australian Grand Prix. Um, and then the race came round and I was I was so nervous at the start because I didn't know if I was going to be able to get it off the line. Again, we didn't know practice starts really. We got two red lights. When they go out, we're away in Melbourne for 2009. It's Jensen Button and an awful start there by Rubens Barrichello. Jensen Button streaks forward. Settles there as well. Fastest trying to come through on the outside as well. Ross Bird's up in closer tennis as well, up into third place. Or oh, there is actually Kubitz has come back as well. Dreadful start for Rubens Barrichello. And there's all sorts of mayhem at the first quarter. But Jensen Button is away. And I got a mega start. One of my best starts in Formula 1. Um, and just drove away into Turn 1. Rubens had a bad start lots of clutch slip and was back into the pack. Whereas I had the cleanest run and I, I think I pulled a second, second and a half out by turn three. Um, so everything was looking good and then we got to the pit stop. Pitting this lap then, come into the pits at the end of this lap. Here's then Jensen Button in. Now let's, let's see how long this will be. Barrichello was 21 seconds. And that included that front nose. Fuel goes in. Oh, there's a problem here. Now that didn't help. Oh. Oh dear, dear. Release, release. So I think, yeah, they took eight seconds longer than everyone else's pit stops, I think. So it put us into a really tricky situation. But we didn't have a refueling guy that had any experience. You know, the guy that was our refueling guy, he left because he was going to be made redundant anyway. So he ended up, I think he went to be a plumber. So the first race, we actually had a, a guy that had no experience of refueling whatsoever. Um, and these, these things are heavy. You know, they're really heavy to get onto the car. And when the fuel comes through, and then you've got to take it off, and uh, it's not easy. We didn't luck, luck in in the first race because we had the pace. But in terms of a team, we didn't do the best job, as you wouldn't expect. You're going up against the best in the world who have practiced all winter. And we hadn't. So we, uh, we kind of, yeah, we got a little bit lucky at times during that race. Um, Seb Vettel and Kubica crashed as well as they were chasing me down. So it left it wide open for my teammate as well to finish P2, uh, to get a 1-2 finish. So it was the dream scenario for the team that didn't think they'd exist. They were going to exist uh, only, only a few months ago. I was called up to Nick's office on the Friday before the Australian Grand Prix. Um, and I distinctly remember him asking me what I was doing that weekend, what I had planned. I said, oh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to prepare for Australia. Um, I'd probably go and see my parents. And he said, well, what I need you to do is on Monday morning, you need to get on the plane to Australia. Unfortunately, we've had to make your boss redundant. So you are in charge. You're going to be in charge of our comms. There's a very strong likelihood we're going to win the race. And we're going to announce Richard Branson and Virgin as a sponsor. I mean, we had no money whatsoever. I mean, we were traveling around as cheaply as we could. We were sending the minimum number of people to races because we didn't have any money. Um, we didn't have any sponsors, although we quickly accumulated some nice ones when it looked like we were going to do well, including obviously Virgin, which 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 helped us a lot. So it was a, for me, it was fantastic. You know, I, I, I genuinely thought I would probably lose my job um, right up to the point of being a week before Australia. Um, and then for that to turn around and realize that, you know, a lot of my close colleagues, my manager had lost their job and there were now four of us in marketing who were going to be responsible for turning this, this situation around and sort of going out to Australia and representing the team was quite, quite incredible. But I think it was tempered with the, the very real thought that when I left for Australia on Monday, I knew when I came back the following week that there would be a lot of my colleagues who wouldn't be there. Um, and that was really sad at the same time because a lot of us had been there for many years together. Um, and we were going from, I think we must have been a department of about 16, maybe. Um, and we were going from that 16, 16, 17, we were going down to four. And that would be it. It would just be those four people from the from the big team that we'd had. So that part of it was, was very sad. Um, but for me personally, it was also a great opportunity and a great challenge. You know, we all looked at each other and said, well, this is what we can do if we, if we have an average weekend. You know, if we can polish up on, on the areas that we were weak. And maybe maybe let's speak to the uh, plumber to get him back in to put fuel in the car for the next race, which they did. Yeah, if that was a tough weekend, imagine what a weekend that went smoothly would be like. And smooth weekends is exactly what they went on to do. With a team full of passion, 
perseverance and now petrol they kept pushing and what would come over the next seven races would be six incredibly dominant wins here's the man who didn't know he had a team didn't know he had a drive who's now going to take victory in melbourne winner in australia winner in malaysia but only half points but round the final turn and Jensen Button and Braun are back on the top step of the podium. Here is Jensen Button, winner in Melbourne, winner in Malaysia, winner in Bahrain, and he's done it again in Barcelona. He wasn't on pole, but he was on the front row. And here he comes for another checkered flag. Jensen Button, the Button bandwagon rolls into Silverstone with Jensen Button winning six out of seven races and that championship is getting ever nearer. The winds were coming thick and fast and Braun GP were on top of the world, but no win meant more than the illustrious Monaco Grand Prix. But this is a checkered flag he was probably dreaming about. Jensen Button coming through now for Braun Grand Prix. We're in the sixth race and it's his fifth victory. And that is champion's form in anybody's book. Jensen Button wins in Monaco. You've done it, man. Great job. The one we all wanted. Well done. Awesome drive. Monaco, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was an awesome race. And... And a race that I'll never forget. You know, it's a it's a special one winning in Monaco. I was living there at, the, at that time as well, so it's a very very big celebration. And you know, when you win, you celebrate with everyone. The race itself, I slept through. I'd, I'd had um, two or three very late nights with sponsors um, and uh, potential sponsors. First, I knew that we won was uh, Nicola Armstrong, our PR lady, was kind of shaking me, saying, uh, "Go and get the trophy." I shall never forget Ross saying, "Look." We're pretty close to winning this race, Nicola. Are we going to put Nick on the podium? Just go and give, go, go and let him know, would you? And searching everywhere for him, and then to finally find him asleep was was quite a moment. So uh, yeah, he looked slim, somewhat startled when I woke him up to tell him he needed to get himself to the podium. <laughs> when it really comes home is is there's a a, a dinner that night at the uh, the sporting club. And only the winning team are invited. Everyone is in this huge, beautiful uh, uh, banqueting room, and uh, they clap you in. So they're all standing, you know, standing up, banging the tables and what have you. And uh, you know, and that sort of moment, you just kind of the super special. And then obviously, you, you sit down at the top table, and uh, you know, it was Ross and I and our, our wives and uh, Jensen and his girlfriend, um, and you're on the top table with. Um, with the royal family you get to sit next to the crown prince uh prince albert um and uh yeah it was uh it was pretty pretty awesome i was actually sat next to his niece as well um so yeah a, a fun evening towards the end of the dinner uh you know the the, the roof motors back at the end um and so you're, you know, you're out in the fresh air as it were but very quietly and you know you barely notice it happening and then this huge firework display is going on above your head and uh, you know one of the memorable moments was was you know the look on Jensen's face was just of a uh, you know a 5 year old just in you know, I think probably all of us in absolute wonderment I mean Monaco itself whatever situation you're in wherever you're winning or losing it is just the most amazing weekend um, and if you ever get the chance to go as a fan you, you just got to do it it i mean it's something else it's difficult it's noisy it's exhausting and it's just a really hard place to work in <laughs> logistically um and i just that the the attention that we had from the media and the sort of the closeness of the the closeness of the paddock the track it's just an amazing atmosphere coming out of monaco braun gp were on a massive high However, little did they know that that would be one of the last highs they would feel for a while. In what is looked back on and remembered as this incredible fairy tale season for Braun, they had their fair share of low points. People forget how it was at times that year, and it was pretty tough at times um, for the whole team. When things started to get difficult, you know, there started to be some sort of cracks. I mean, Rubens didn't have the best luck or didn't make best luck for himself, whichever way you look at it. So he felt kind of slightly hard done by. Jensen, uh, you know, the drivers have to believe it's all them. And so uh, I would say the thing that won the championship was the car. Jensen did a good job, but, um, you know, he nearly blew it. 
when the the pressure came on, like most sports people, like most human beings, it starts to get really tough when the uh, the pressure's on you. So, I mean, he started to get a bit more antsy. Uh, we were hanging on by our fingertips. We clearly did not have the fastest car. Red Bull had the fastest car from actually pretty early on in the season. If you look at qualifying, they uh, overtook us pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, we had great long run pace and uh, we could win races, but in uh, qualifying, we weren't necessarily the quickest. So I think we won the first six races and then we didn't win again until Rubens won in Valencia, I think, which was a lot, a long way into the summer. So that kind of point in the middle of the season where we were really struggling was very tough. Um, I think that was the point at which everyone was tired because you were doing effectively doing the jobs of two, three, four people. And that was the point at which you had to really grit your teeth and sort of pull, it, pull everybody through that period. Um, and I don't think there was ever a point at which we thought we were going to win the championship because it just got so difficult towards the end. Um, and I think if you look at the results, you sort of notice that. I remember Singapore as being a particularly, a particularly tough weekend. For me personally, I found it very difficult. I would, I'd reached the stage of the season where I was exhausted. Um, you know, we were flying, we were flying economy. We were turning up late. We, we'd just run out of steam, basically. And I think that was a really difficult race for everybody. It was difficult for Jensen. I think, from memory, he finished 14th. Um, and that felt like the lowest point. There were a few things that were an issue. One was that we weren't developing and everyone else had developed this double diffuser that we had. Um, and they had the resources to keep pushing the car forward. Um, we didn't. Mentally, it was the toughest year I ever had in motorsport. Um, you know, I've had bad years in motorsport, but you get over them. That one was tough because it's a bit like Max now in F1. And it's because they suddenly have an opportunity to win for the win the World Championship and fight for that World Championship, which they haven't had for so long. They don't know if that's going to come around again next year or five years' time. I also struggled with that. I started pushing too hard and... Um, not driving in the way that um, worked for me. You know, I, I needed to be smooth. I needed to be precise. If I, if I break too late for a corner, it just didn't work with my style. Um, but um, yeah, and then we came through to the end of the season. I had a couple of reasonably good results. Um, for me, the strength was more the racing than the qualifying because I just couldn't get the tyres working qualifying. Um, so some good results. And then it came to Brazil. Rio de Janeiro may have the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympic Games in 2016, but Formula One rules in Sao Paulo, second biggest city in the world, and with one of the city's own sons starting from pole and gunning for the championship, this could be another special day at Interlagos. Frankly, there is no other Grand Prix crowd which radiates such energy, such enthusiasm and such electricity. And after the mayhem of qualifying in the rain yesterday and the session that seemed to have no end, where is the championship heading, you wonder? The title that seemed to be Jensen Buttons for the taking still hangs in the balance, even though he could have been scripting. Well, I, I love Brazil. It's such a great set track into Lagos. My teammate was obviously Brazilian. Uh, Brazilians are very patriotic, and uh, they didn't like me being competitive. And they, they were pretty tough on me, actually. I found it really tough mentally that weekend. You know, they were booing me when I was out on track or when I was in the garage, and they could see me. And... Um, it, in all the restaurants I was at, they would put a ladder outside of the entrance, so I had to walk under the ladders. So it was like bad luck, and it did get to me, I have to say. I think everybody was desperate to get it wrapped up. Um, I think the pressure by that point had, had built to quite a crescendo. You could tell it was affecting everybody, and it affecting Jensen, I think, as well. And it was just a determined feeling, right, we've got to get it done. I mean, it could, it, anything could happen, and it could go horribly wrong, but we hoped it would go we hoped it would go brilliantly. So I think it was a real sense of anticipation, a lot of nerves, um, and just a feeling of wanting to get it over the line so we could relax and enjoy the final race. And so after a long, hard and expensive season, Braun had got to the finish line. The chequered flag was closer than ever and they could really do it. They could be champions. The nerves were high and the pressure was on. All they had to do was qualify well and bring the title home in the race. But in classic Braun style, they couldn't make it easy for themselves. I mean, it was obviously really stressful because we didn't qualify well. You know, it wasn't a relaxing weekend from the point of view of, you know, we were in a good position, we weren't in a good position. Qualifying came around and, you know, I loved those wet conditions and I, I thought I'd, I'd be really competitive. We made a mistake on the tyre choice and I ended up back on 14th on Jensen the grid. Button. 14th fastest and coming into the pits, 
the championship leader will not be going into Q3. My teammate was on pole. Sebastian Vettel, the other title contender, was was behind me, so it wasn't too bad. Um, I got out onto the grid before the race. Everyone's booing me, you know, throwing stuff. And it was tough. And I have to say, I had all the British journalists by my side, you know, whether they write good or stuff about you, they were they were there, they were supportive, and it was really nice to have that. Um, went out, had an amazing race, a drive I knew I had to do to really deserve the world championship and uh, the race of my life. You know, I, I knew everything was on the line that race. And there was one race to go in the championship, but I didn't want to leave it till then. I wanted to win it in Brazil. Battle through, and now here comes Jensen Button, the 2009 world champion. Look at the relief, look at the joy. It's all now out in the open. Braun are the constructors champions. Jensen Button is world champion. They didn't believe it almost after qualifying yesterday, down in 14th, his worst ever qualifying of the season, and yet he's come through. Crossed the finish line in fifth, won the World Championship, and uh, obviously saw my dad, who was the first person I saw, so I gave him a big hug. And it was awesome, you know, I watched the footage back and I see myself crossing the line and uh, singing We Are The Champions, which was pretty amazing, I must say. We are world champions! World champions! Um, and then seeing the team on the pit wall, you know, Andrew, Shub Andrew Shovlin, uh, Ron Meadows, who was the team manager, um, Bono, who's, uh, who's Lewis, his chief engineer now, um, Ross Braun. But then it shoots to you know, Team Bun, which was, which was my dad, whoever else I mentioned. They're all cuddling and cheering and shouting and crying, and, and those emotions are... Uh, are pretty awesome to see when he uh, he uh, won the world championship and went across the line. You know there was just it was it was mayhem, and obviously uh, you know especially the British press, but really globally it was just this extraordinary thing where these people who had no right to exist suddenly had um, you know won the world championship in style. It was just the perfect dream year to have in Formula One. Really, it's so different to how to how things were previously and how things are now. And I think we were very aware at the time that this was a, a one-off year that would not be repeated. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm immeasurably proud when I look back at what we achieved um, and more really how we pulled together as a team and managed to get through it because it was tough. Um, and I think that's perhaps something you don't see from the outside is how hard it was and how hard people worked um, and how grueling it was to get through a season with such a small team. So that, yeah, the feeling of accomplishment post-Brazil was was quite something it was one hell of a team party <laughs> and they did it braun really did it in their maiden and ultimately only season as a formula one team they came through to take not only the drivers championship but the constructors title too and they are still to this date the only team since the first season of formula one over 70 years ago to take a title on their first try and that that is why i love this story so much and why it has stuck with me for years since, because at the depths of the 2008 financial crisis, the team found themselves in an overwhelmingly bad position. But through the dedication and perseverance of the entire Brackley team, they came back, and not only continued where the previous Honda team had left off, but strove further, managing to take themselves to championship glory. The Braun team really is the definition of a Phoenix team born from the ashes of its Honda-based predecessor. Although that was the only season they ran under the Braun GP name, the Brackley team didn't stop there. At the end of 2009, Ross and Nick sold the team to their engine provider and paved the way for a team that would go on to win the most consecutive titles in the history of the sport and arguably become one of the most successful Formula 1 teams of all time. That team, of course, was none other than Mercedes-AMG Petronas F1. They've been imperious for the last seven seasons. It's seven consecutive Constructors' Championships for Mercedes. They win! 